This is the WGBH Forum Network. So, it's not your father's website. We've grown, you know, 10 years later. I can remember our first PBS online summit. We fit in half of a boardroom. Eventually, over a few years, we were taking over a hotel. Was it in Arlington, I think? There were several. There were, downtown. There were several. And Baltimore. now to look out today and see this crowd, in particular the people in this crowd, it's just amazing to think what we're talking about today. So we're excited. So how it's produced, user-generated, blogging. The more I heard about blogging last session, I'm wondering if it shouldn't be called blagging. You know, I'm, I'm a blagger. It's a British term. Uh, use of broadband and interstitials to test TV series. We're seeing that a lot in commercial television where people are testing out characters. So it's changing. The whole paradigm shift is changing how we are producing across platforms. Flash for TV and web animation tools. Our team, for example, at WGBH Interactive Kids, have made several flash applets that actually became part of the television program for Between the Lines, including writing some of those scripts. So it's mixing, mixing up teams in a very, very productive way. How our content is distributed or received, peer-to-peer, -peer, RSS feeds, people are just putting in a Google alert to get what they want. My sister put in our last name. And out of all eight kids, the only ones she keeps sending around is how my mother won the, the latest golf tournament in the island of Alameda. So that's, I highly encourage you to put in your mother's name and Google alert. So how audiences interact with their content, sharing it, ripping, mixing, burning it, expressing themselves in online social networking communities. And then, of course, how it's accessed. We all know when, where, how you want it, always on. But we, what may not be so obvious is we are constantly thinking about, wow, wouldn't it be great if we put our content on iPods because we can reach kids? And then you hear, but you can only put it on this URL. Okay, so just because it's on that hardware doesn't mean they're going to like it, doesn't mean they're going to find it. So if they're not keen on one of our shows on air, the fact that it just got way smaller for a website they're not going to anyway we're asking the wrong question. We'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. It doesn't mean we can't reach them. I would say that in actuality, probably a lot of kids would like watching Nova, Mastery's Theater, Frontline. It just never occur to them to tune in. So we really have to reshape our thinking about, does it all have to be at one URL? Where are they? So it's not just what it's on. It's not a hardware decision. It's a real user context. Okay. So, uh, you know, when we were talking about Not Your Father's Website, it was before Henry gave his keynote. And so when I, I'm embarrassed because maybe it is our father's website. So, so kudos to Henry for all the work he's done over the years. For He said he's come full circle. So in the spirit of open content, I was uh, with Henry in our WGBH reunion not too long ago. And at that reunion, he was with some of his old mates in which they did a lot of those early testing. They honored Henry. He's not here, is he? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, they honored Henry, of course, he's just about the most amazing leader anybody could have. So at that time, they honored Henry with a doll in the image of Henry. And so what I'm noticing is that maybe it is our father's website, and it's due to the great leadership of Henry that we've been able to actually do a lot of these, a lot of these great uh, projects at GBH. And in case that makes any of you nervous, there's also other executives at WGBH in which our employees are in great hands. Meet John Abbott. Okay. Don't worry, this is wholly open. This is a license-free photo, you know, so if you need to download it, please don't attribute it. Okay, so in all seriousness, at the reunion, here's John talking to some of our key staff, and you're looking at Marilyn and Sheila Brass. Now, these women are just amazing and they have just published one of the most gorgeous, well thought out recipe books from recipes they've recovered from, I think the turn of the century, Margaret, are you here? So, is, so when you think about the talent in our own system, in our own stations, in our own communities, within public broadcasting, would that make a great blog? Because when you think about what Sheila and Marilyn have done, the kinds of things they could blog about their own work in that cooking realm. So I want us to consider really spreading our thinking about embrace who's right around us and think that could not only be an interesting blog, but that type of blog might actually serve our traditional on-air older demographics. Okay. 
So here we are with a matured website, Web 2.0. I know that's a little buzzword compliant. But does it all seem way too familiar? If you turn back the clock 25 years when we went to desktop publishing, oh my god. The newspaper said no, the magazines, you know, those of us that were traditional typesetters, I was among them. We were horrified when kids would come in for a job and they'd say, I know all about leading, you know, because they knew PageMaker. What was it going to do to our craft? What was it going to do to our work? And the ability to put these tools into the hands of people that didn't know much, but they knew much more than we did about how to use the tools. Typesetting shops closed down. Printers were slow to come to the table. People reinvented themselves. I was working at IBM Design Center, and I suggested that a lot of what they're asking me to do, I could go home and do it on a Mac. They did everything by pen and ink. And I said, well, some people say IBM stands for, you know, I become Macintosh. Well, at the time, three years later, that department had shut down, and we started a new digital department in a corporation that was ready for the transition. Interestingly, that organization of IBM is so similar to us in so many ways. Same values, high quality, real customer service, just top notch. They have done a tremendous job of reinventing themselves and surviving and transitioning and that's where we are. We can make those same transitions and not, uh, not skimp on any of our, our value system. But that means we have to collectively, at the national and local level, really embrace the fact that we're not just a broadcast television company anymore. So let's change the way we ask our, our asking the question. What happens at the local level when that could be bypassed on air? Well, and actually, actually, we've got the best, probably the best uh, competition there is to have a local convener in each of our areas with 180, 200 locations. So it's an advantage. So the fact that we're not just a broadcast television company anymore uniquely positions us to be much more of the center of these communities. But we're looking at change in cultural priorities. So with all that quality and how we go about looking at what we do, it's a it's fantastic, we win Emmys, we do incredible storytelling, and we also feel a lot of need for control. So we want to embrace how do we get to the younger audiences, and we want to reach them, and we want to figure out how we can put our foreign culture of control in a culture that is driven by non-control. So it's really about looking very honestly at our cultural priorities and deciding what we're willing to give up and what not. Our editorial teams, you know, people are wearing lots of different hats. James said to us last night, you know, have a geek at your table from the very beginning of a project. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with him more. Not only is your technologist and your interactive designer at the beginning of a project going to extend your thinking, and the example he gave, they actually came up with a technology that really extended where they were going. But let's not overlook the other obvious point of including your interactive team. And I mean from the beginning of a broadcast program because the technologists in our group, they're actually so close to the culture. They're not just giving us technical solutions. They're giving us a solution from that other foreign land lens. So as people early and often, and don't, I think with editorial teams, we're no longer pigeonholed. People that are podcasting nowadays, they do the interview, they do the cut, they do the voiceover, it's soup to nuts. We're not doing five, six people teams anymore. Technical production, I think that goes hand in hand with thinking about how do we understand where we're going from the inception of a project so we can capitalize on those parallel productions. The budget expectations is an interesting one. If I'm understanding my colleagues correctly, I'm understanding that copyright, we're sued. Copyright and licensing is primarily evolved from a protecting our value, protecting our market, yeah? I mean, protecting that you want to not give it away when it costs us so much, we have to also be able to recoup our costs. Just like desktop publishing, now that you have the hands, you know, you've got Final Cut Pro and cheap cameras in people's hands, it didn't cost them anything to begin with. So there's really not really much to protect except for their attributions, and they can afford to put it up there. So if we have volumes and volumes of content, that people don't necessarily have to protect their original investment, it's great, it's open content, but what does that mean for us? So I would suggest that it, we really need to think about who we are in open content. For example, I'll use the desktop, uh, de desktop publishing analogy to say, 
We got a lot of desktop pollution in those days. We had four or five fonts on one page, and we had clip art. Okay. <laughs> Are we really just interested, and I know the answer is no, but as we move to open content, I don't think we want to be the clip art, the video clip art of open content. It's the context we bring to it. And I know people use curation. I, I'll definitely, I like that word, but I'm really looking more for the context. How do we keep our values, provide open content, but in a way that creates more value, like in the teacher's domain example. We can put lots and lots of clips up. Well, we can put full programs so teachers can record it, but more is not better. So let's not be the clip art of desktop, the clip art of open content. Let's be what we already have been in so many other avenues, which is adding value. Now another place that we're really moving quickly towards, and it's hard to keep up, is just the fact that all that we do, much more so than before, measurement, evaluation, and outcomes, that really changes the way we even go into a project to begin with. So when we're looking at a web project from its inception, who are we reaching? What are the takeaways? What kind of goals do we have? I think we have similar conversations in broadcast teams, but that's so much more of a broader audience. You're trying to be a lot to a lot of people. But where we are in interactive, we have to really narrow down and define those goals up front so we know what success looks like. So playing on my desktop uh, publishing analogy, we need to think different. Does anybody, can anybody imagine, you know, if we had this branding conversation in some of our environments? Hmm, think different. We're an educational company. We'd beat this to heck, wouldn't we? So first of all, we'd say, hey, hey, you know, that's not, that's not correct. Adverbs describe the verb, adjectives describe the noun. And if Sister Marie Robert was here with me today, she'd say, repeat after me. Adverbs describe the verb, adjectives describe the noun. We're overthinking it. A logo like this still remains in some of the top 10, top most remembered. So, if we do that, and do this, and so I don't just pick on, you know, my brethren, I'll take full responsibility. You know, I never quite know what I'm going to say when I get up here, and unfortunately, neither does GBH. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure this is exactly what we mean, think differently. So, let's think about what life after broadcast, or is it life after beyond? <laughs> Sister Robert's going to come back again. Okay, it's supposed to be a cross out on the after. So, keeping a theme of Open content is a great aspiration. It's a continuum. Where we are today, Creative Commons, all at YouTube. We don't have to do it all, all at once on every project. Thanks to Lou Wiley's great comments on that, it was just so obvious that let's add our value to deciding how we can actually put open content in, but not at the same time trying to control it. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But meanwhile, Life beyond broadcast is also about how we collaborate, our media partnerships. Rx for survival, wow. Do we air the program the same, same week Time Magazine runs a cover and NPR is doing uh, spots on their front, their home page? Amazing. Book coming out from Penguin. So our collaboration with community partnerships, I might as well just say community uh, partnerships run by stations. Stations are more relevant than ever and we really need to help build an infrastructure so they can feel and contribute to making us all better instead of uh, not always being at the center of our thinking. Educators, formal and informal, uh, we've talked about that a bit. Again, I'd look to uh, teacher source, teacher line, teacher's domain, think port, all kinds of great systems in the system. And then accessibility in all that we do. What might not be obvious though, is when we make our content continually to be deep, broad, and contextualized, it has far more reach beyond broadcast. So we're allowed to establish a much more widespread access to places, people, allows flexible, layered learning, deepens people's cognitive understanding. Some of our websites misunderstood minds. If you want to know what it's like to have ADHD after you spent the last year yelling at your kid, because he wasn't behaving, and then you feel terrible, but you don't know what it's like. Log on to Misunderstood Minds, because we take interactive flash applets, and there's no way you could actually complete them, because we worked with experts to say, this is what the kid's feeling. They're hearing, it's not, 
inability to focus. It's the ability to focus on everything at once. So adding our value with interactive media and then maybe using that with open content for kids to say, not only do I feel that, this is also what I go through. So when kids log on, they see themselves. So facilitating a two-way communication and encouraging the creativity via open content models. Enabling simulations, you know, when we did on American Experience the how to make a bomb, you can put in an address. Because Curtis is here, I won't tell the address they constantly put in. <laughs> did you know that story? In the American Experience, when we first put on a, a how to make a bomb, there were like three top addresses that kids would, would put in. Maybe not just kids, users. You know, it would be North, Northwest, it would be uh, somewhere near Alexandria and DC. 1600 Pennsylvania. 1600 Pennsylvania, I think was the top one. So anyway, the real point though is you could not ever replicate in a classroom the kinds of things we can do online and have it driven by the broadcast. So therefore, we submit to you today that we are contributing to the social fabric of historical record. And by that we mean, and I'm going to credit Howard Cutler for a lot of this great work, if we look at enhanced broadband programs, and I think Curtis, you were a great consultant on this project as well. So. Open content, one, one definition yesterday with James, he said it's not just stuff that you can download and mix and mash, if I understood you right, James, it's really about just also making content available. What commercial company is going to take the time to put you know, interviews from Commanding Heights from 41 countries with major leaders online forever or in perpetuity, is that forever? Is that the same thing as in perpetuity, forever? <laughs> um, so the fact that we are contributing to the core public knowledge, that's what we're about in public media. And I think we have to be mindful that we don't just embrace any form of open content so we say we did. Again, buzzword compliance. Develops and brings to light new perspectives and new information simply, rather than simply repackaging. The kinds of work that we do it requires significant commitment of resources to create it. So it's not likely to ever be replicated or not in the near future matches definite needs within a variety of formal ed, and it's likely to be useful for an extended period of time. So as we begin to build criteria for the kinds of things we would like to make available in open content, let's not forget what people come to us to begin with anyway and tie it back so they can also contribute to, to being part of the public knowledge. So instead of clip art, why not be the new video Wikipedia? Because if we were a video Wikipedia, <coughs> That would, and that, maybe not that, it's probably too expensive, but the point though is, is it really just about putting it out there so someone could do stuff? Or is it really about putting it out there so somebody can advance the conversation about really what the topic was to begin with? I'm not sure how we set that up, but I'd sure love to figure out a way for the front line, for example, to have that openness be a collective intelligence to get to an even more interesting definition, like Wikipedia. So clip art, YouTube, Wikipedia, you know, we really have to think about who we are in that continuum and where we want to be and what brands and what series that we're working with. So some examples of our core public knowledge programs, obviously this great recent program with Frontline's Age of AIDS, NOVA's Building on Ground Zero, RX for Survival, and you can read it. Africans in America, it still gets some of the most traffic, I mean, we, that site hasn't been updated since 1998. Amazing. So, if we get too far away from our core values, too far away from what gives us that depth and breadth, we will get too far away from why we are so successful in Google. When we show, I'm gonna show the following slides about Google rankings, I apologize, has anybody seen some of these? A couple of you probably have, no? Okay. Uh, I wanna say up front, so I wanna say up front, we're not gaming Google, who can? It's because of the depth and quality of our content. You go to evolution, you know, number one. People could say, those change daily, hourly. And they do. Words like evolution, DNA, world economy. In 2002, evolution was number one out of 17 million, DNA fifth, world economy. Notice we're not saying evolution in PBS, evolution in WGBH. Okay, so April when we Googled it, not much had changed. Only now evolution is number one out of 587 search, res search responses. DNA went from fifth to three out of 15.6 million. 
to 308 million. You see the drill. Now, I'm not saying we'll always hold that standing, but interestingly, when I went on last night, most of these rankings were exactly the same, but what had changed is out of how many search results, that had actually gone down. So we saw that they probably did some type of uh, redundancy. Uh, there was all kinds of technical reasons that our guys said could have happened. The interesting thing is it was still in the hundreds of millions and our rankings hadn't changed. So let's not go video clip art. Okay, long tail. I think that speaks for itself. Life after these broadcasts continue to endure. And then this is the last one, and then I think I'll save tips in case there's death. Okay, so if you want to see the gift that keeps on giving, again, I'm going to credit Howard and Curtis for a lot of this great work, funded by Argosy and Carnegie. If you look at how much money was spent on the project for commanding heights, a finite amount of money, so let's just say it was $100. So you can see that the online cost to build that site was a little less than 10% of that project cost. But in the first 24 months, that broadcast hit, uh, where you can see the purple line, and on the right on online, just about double. So in the first two years, you've got a two to one return on cost versus how many people reached. So got it? So if it costs $100 to do the whole project and we spent 10 on online, we actually have twice the value for who we reached online for that investment. Make sense? Howard, did I butcher that? Okay, project that 10 years out. The broadcast has pretty much gone away. And a lot of the clips are online, though. So, in fact, most of the show um, is available online. With a modest investment of updating some of the data, we're getting more towards an 8 to 1, 9 to 1 return on investment. And it's important to note that we didn't just put clips online, we put clips online in a context that allowed it to, in context, re link to related materials. The entire show. The entire show minus a few minutes, I thought. Uh, a few slides. Okay, so uh, I could say six hours, basically, in clips. And if you want to say two more sentences about the story arc, or, no? Okay, we're good. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on. My parting words are, if you want to remain relevant and we want to be self-reflective, Look through the mirror. I mean, look through the window and not in the mirror, right? You know, you just reflect, but know the angle of reflection. Ask the right questions. Challenge your assumptions. And uh, time permitting, we'll give you some tips from the trenches. Thanks, Annie. Sure. I'm Dave Johnston. I'm uh, sitting in on this panel for Mary Kadera, uh, PBS Vice President of Education, who uh, is unable to attend the event uh, due to a family emergency. Mary had uh, prepared remarks for this session, and I was thinking uh, after yesterday's discussions that in the spirit of this conference, I could do a, uh, a mashup of what <laughs> she had prepared, uh, reversing the content and inserting liberally my own remarks. Uh, however, I, I got to thinking about an interview that Bob Cringely did with Ken Burns in part of the uh, digital TV Cringely A Crash Course. Uh, you may remember the scene, uh, Cringely and, uh, and Ken Burns were tossing a baseball back and forth and discussing the subject of interactive television and the ability for a viewer then to control the experience, a nonlinear experience perhaps choosing to stop and dig deeper on some subjects or skip some segments altogether. And uh, Ken then made the point that uh, while he thinks this type of viewing is certainly okay for subsequent, uh, subsequent uses of the content, that the, the original presentation should be as the producer who had invested time and effort into the production had intended it to be told uh, as a compelling story. And uh, that being said, with your permission, uh, I'd like to go through Mary's remarks as originally written. And uh, in the spirit of journalistic integrity, which found its way at our table, dinner table conversation last night, I'll attempt to identify when I do stray off uh, with my own comments and opinions, maybe making the sign of uh, descriptor Dave Rant. <laughs> so... Um, Mary was asked to address open content in education and also open from the PBS National Organization perspective. And uh, so I'll begin with the education aspect and then lead into some considerations and questions more generally for PBS. Uh, examples of open content projects in the K-12 universe. There are many ways that practitioners are interacting with open content. And uh, here are a few brief examples. I have some URLs to show. 
open content textbooks, collaborative projects, usually using a, a wiki platform to create an alternative to traditional classroom textbooks. Now, in the U.S., we spend about $5 billion per year on textbooks, and that's up significantly from $2 billion in 1991. Wikibooks is a well-known open book and textbook initiative, and Wiki Junior is an offshoot that aims to produce text for children ages 8 to 11. Uh, here's one current effort in Wiki Junior, how things work. And he's got it up on the screen there. Um, the California Open Source Textbook Project, uh, the initiative aims to save the state of California significant funds currently spent on traditional textbooks. It's the open source text.org. Uh, Dave Rant, having been initially with the Adult Learning Service of PBS and seen how integral textbooks were and dealing with textbook publishers, the change in, in their value chain and their model, I'm just, this blows me away. Okay, rant off. Um, <laughs> student produced media. Students incorporate open content into or original works of multimedia. Two long standing and well known initiatives in this vein are National History Day, where half a million students participate each year producing papers, exhibits, original performances, and documentary films. ThinkQuest is an international student multimedia competition where this year's winners uh, include It's All Mine, produced by 10 to 12 year old US and Bulgarian students, and A Dollar a Day, produced by 14 and 15 year old students in US and Switzerland, which also <coughs> includes a blog to incorporate user con comments. Uh, it's all about poverty and targeted to young people and how, how we can change things. Uh, and finally, um, the thinkquest.org, the homepage. Right there. Yeah. Okay, open source approaches to, uh, to, to uh, change in school district operations. The, uh, the Bering Strait, Strait School District is one interesting example. Uh, the district is taking an open source collaborative approach to producing and refining its student achievement standards and curriculum frameworks. Uh, the district is using open source and collaborative approach also to building and refining technical infrastructure, including their student data systems. So what do educators want from PBS in, an open, co in open content, and how would they use it? Uh, Mary asked several educators who work across the country and have advised PBS in various capacities over the past few years, and thus are familiar with our content. Uh, most are interested in downloadable video and games. They understand they could get images, text, and more from PBS, but feel there are already good sources for this. Some would use it for presentation discussion uh, with students in fairly traditional ways, instructionally. They would like to download it, to store it locally, to avoid bandwidth congestion during the school day when, when accessing the ac assets remotely. Others would like to see PBS open content wind up in educator-produced courses for virtual learning environments. A good example is the Florida Virtual High School. Still others would use it for student-produced multimedia. History and science are areas of very strong interest, and educators would like to see it available to grades K through 12, not just upper grades with older students. Now, other considerations that educators noted for PBS as with non-open content today, it would require good cataloging and a good search mechanism to be really effective. PBS should participate in emerging open content portals like PBS has done with past education portals like the Department of Ed sponsored Gateway to Educational Materials, the GEM project. The educators asked, well, what does PBS, what does it say if PBS is not there from perception and mission perspective? They remind us that open content to be used really effectively, not just to mimic existing methods of traditional instruction, educators will require good professional development about the best uses of open content. Time and time again, we've seen promising technologies and media used in ways that merely shadow the old. For instance, five years ago, in a very early video on demand streaming pilot that PBS conducted, funded by the Arthur, Daney, uh, Arthur Vining Davis Foundation, we provided a video on demand uh, service prototype with searchable on demand uh, Ken Burns, Lewis, and Clark video content to about 17 schools. In some schools, this was used in innovative ways. 
and directly by students as well. In other schools, the teacher passed out a worksheet, turned off the lights, and showed the segments uh, he had queued up so the students could fill in the worksheets. We know that technology alone does not change teacher attitudes and behaviors. There are considerations about demonstrating impact, particularly in the current No Child Left Behind focused federal climate. Open content will be seen by many in the federal circle as a, quote, nice to have if we can't show how it improves student learning over conventional methods. Uh, when used powerfully as part of inquiry-based learning, uh, this can probably be demonstrated through student-constructed multimedia, virtual instruction. Some of this data exists, but it needs to be aggregated and expanded. Uh, in the area of promotion, nothing new or specific to open content per se, but educators remind us that they can't use our content if we don't do a good job letting them know what we have and where it can be accessed. Finally, educators highlight the importance of an easy way to access and share others' uses of open content. They'd like to see what another teacher or student did with the same or similar assets from PBS or from other sources. Uh, this leads me to some important considerations for PBS with respect to education and more generally. When PBS exhibits at national education conferences, inevitably we get many inquiries about our most popular programs. And the most popular of all, by the conference floor informal vote is eyes on the prize. Hmm. If we approached open content with a philosophy that would make open the most educationally valued of our titles, then eyes would be right at the top of the list. However, we know that this would be a rights nightmare. But rant on. Uh, I am encouraged by the notion of a broader use of, of fair use. I don't know. It's probably, I don't know how it could be applied necessarily. I'm glad American experience is, uh, is re-releasing eyes, but uh, you know, to truly make it open would be a fabulous thing. Uh, so Mary goes on, so how do I amass and aggregate a good collection of open content? Some of the questions we have been asking include, should it happen through new innovating with new producers, which the eyes example might suggest? Uh, if rights will encumber our regular legacy fair, or, or can it be part of an approach going forward with our tried and true signature PBS content? Should it be embedded in all we do or just reserved for special projects? So far, Cringely's Nerd TV is, the, is only open content on PBS.org and uh, a web original not tied to any of PBS's on-air signature brands. Uh, in green lighting, should PBS incentivize the production and aggregation of open content by making some number of open content assets part of a producer's deliverables? And or should PBS establish some kind of dedicated allocation within its overall NPS budget that would fund open content projects? If PBS pursued one of these options, uh, options with respect to how it acquires content, how would the desire for open content stack up against other factors and priorities when making green lighting decisions? With respect to promotion, you probably know that PBS is working with many NPS producers to deliver coordinated promotion on YouTube, iFilms, and Google Video. Each of these providers has expressed an increased desire to feature PBS promotional content. But they need trailers that are cleared for streaming and are download. When PBS contacted producers, only Frontline stepped forward uh, and said they'd be willing to reversion some promos to enable this to happen. Again, promotional material. This is free promotion reaching millions per day. How can and should PBS incentivize this type of open content? Importantly, any consideration of open content should also encompass a smart approach to user-generated content. The provision of open content is one part of an overall dynamic, being able to showcase user-generated content and more specifically the user-generated works involving reversioning of PBS-provided open content is being truly open and showing the public that public broadcasting is contributing to a larger community and invigorating the sense of public. There are mission-based reasons to do this. There are also advocacy and funding reasons to do this when we can show people are really engaged with public broadcasting in powerful ways. We require a smart educational strategy to showcase user-generated content along with the parent-vetted, quote parent, highly produced resources that we know many members of the public, uh, including educators, still seek from us. Also, we must confirm within our system the willingness to have user-generated content at all. 
By one example, some producers on PBS.org are still not comfortable with the live postings to discussion boards and feedback areas. Uh, this fall's Save Your Nights promotion campaign provides another interesting example. The campaign rolls out this fall, and PBS has contended with uh, concerns aside its organization, as well as from producers about credibility and the worry, what if they say something bad about us? Not only must we be committed to the value of open content, but we must be committed to creating an environment where content is shared and draws people into community. Finally, a significant consideration for PBS is that it can't just be about producers and PBS engaging with end users. We must also facilitate the engagement of stations with their local communities and support their own media work. To that end, we have been exploring how, in an open content world, PBS's back end, system and tools for stations, can be significantly expanded to provide a hub of aggregated access to open content produced in relation to the MPS properties PBS is distributing, and potentially other open content from within the system. This would allow all member stations to access a one-stop shop to find open content assets that could be downloaded and used locally, and it would allow us some measure of aggregated tracking and usage of this open content. We believe that this would be a valuable service we could provide to the membership but we also need further conversation with the producers who would be responsible for delivering these assets to know if it is truly feasible. And that ends Mary's formal comments, but I'd like to follow up just a little bit on the, on the final comment about the station role. Uh, the, the last point, I think, bears a lot more discussion. I believe there's somewhat of an elephant in the room waiting to be noticed, and uh, that elephant uh, is the changing roles of PBS and its member stations in an open content world. Uh, Dennis Harsager on his Technology 360 website has a, uh, a diagram that points out uh, a number of new distribution models uh, that are different, very much different from the current value chain of distribution. Uh, the current chain being producer to PBS, PBS to station, station to end user. Uh, Dennis's model definitely shows some things that bypass uh, one or more of the middle segments of that distribution. I was heartened last night uh, by uh, BBC's Open Archive uh, keynote, uh, highlighting regional content. Um, but then I realized that that regional content was not being distributed by a regional entity, but rather originating from the central <coughs> archive. Uh, the new distribution paradigms that are arising feel a bit to me like the 1984 Apple computer commercial where the hammer is thrown at the giant screen shattering the TV image. I want to embrace open content and while Jamie Boyle's comments yesterday made me feel that it's, it's okay to feel uncomfortable, I strongly believe that uh, the open content model can and will be of great benefit to consumers of that content but that there's still a lot to be considered in how we get there from where we are right now including a transition plan that models roles, new roles, for our membership. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Carvin, and I come here wearing way too many hats. Uh, when when Judith asked me to participate in this panel, oh, what was it, maybe five, six weeks ago, give or take? Yeah, something like that. Uh, at the time, I was director of an online initiative, an online social network called the Digital Divide Network, uh, which is an online community of 10,000 internet activists in about 150 countries using the website as a platform for blogging and bulletin boards and the like to share best practices on how to bridge the digital divide and improve media literacy and IT literacy. Um, at the same time, I was also uh, working with PBS uh, as one of their bloggers, along with Robert Crinsley, uh, and uh, and the Media Shift blog, I, I I 
contribute to a site on teacher source that's called um, Learning Now, and it was launched in May. And it's intended to be a place where educators can uh, can read and, and talk and argue about the the changing world of education and how it's being impacted by Web 2.0 and We Media. Uh, on top of all that, I spend some of my free time as a correspondent for the video blog Rocket Boom, uh, which, if you're not familiar with, it's the most widely viewed rock, uh, video blog uh, on the internet with between 350,000 and half a million viewers per episode per day, uh, and it's it's a five minute newscast based in many ways on user generated content from around the internet put into a quirky, uh, irreverent context. Uh, but in the five or six intervening weeks since she asked me, I've now joined the NPR team. I'm actually now working at NPR Digital Media as a senior product manager uh, for online communities. And uh, people keep asking me what that's going to mean. And you know, if there's time, I'll talk a bit about, about that later. Uh, but the main thrust of, of my presentation is to focus on open content and user-generated content. It's something I'm personally very passionate about because I'm one of those users that's been generating content on the Internet for a very long time, going back uh, almost exactly 12 years now to 1994. Uh, when Andy Russell brought me on board at CPB on an Annenberg, uh, Washington fellowship. They didn't really know what to do with me at the time, so they told me to keep busy and take a look at education and technology policy issues. And the end result was uh, me developing a website called EdWeb, Exploring Technology and School Reform, which took a look at how telecom policy reform was going to impact the classroom. Specifically, would it lead to every classroom in America having internet access? And if that's the case, what would be the uh, pedagogical impact? What would be the cultural impact, and what would it mean if every kid in America could become a content producer? How would we look at them differently? Uh, in the years since then, I've, I've been involved in a variety of online projects, uh, especially blogging projects. I've, I've been blogging since the very early days on my andycarvin.com site. And one of the things that's really interested me is what happens when you open up blogging pl platforms uh, for people to share their own multimedia content. Uh, just to give you an example of, of, of some of the experiments I've done over the years, one is a project I did about a year and a half ago called The Gates at Central Park. You may remember uh, uh, Christo and Jean-Claude, the artists, uh, did this uh, incredible installation in Central Park setting up these huge orange gates uh, uh, with flowing saf saffron fabric uh, for only two weeks and then it vanished after that. And so I thought it would be interesting to set up a blog in which all the posting privileges were open and that I would not really have sole ownership or sole control over it. So I took all the rules for, uh, for how to access the site and posted them on the right-hand column. So if you wanted to uh, post a comment as if you were the owner of the blog, you would simply email a special blogger address with any photo attachments you'd like to include of your own personal experience of the gates and it would automatically be posted. Uh, similarly, uh, users were encouraged to participate in what I called mob casting. And the idea behind that was to create an interface in which members of the public could come together around a specific issue or an event and use a, just a plain old mobile phone, not even like a smartphone like this, but just a regular old mobile phone in which they could call a number, type in a PIN code, and leave a voicemail message that's automatically converted into an MP3 podcast. And using completely free tools that were available on the internet, still available today, tools like audioblogger.com uh, and FeedBurner, I was able to set this up in about 30 minutes. And uh, uh, suddenly we started getting this large flow of content from people all over the country who were coming to the gates. So for example, is the volume on, on this? Thanks. Let's try that again. Hello from uh, School in the Bronx, uh, CS57. Uh, I, I was uh, a slightly underwhelmed by this event, but you know, it, was, it was okay. Um, my favorite part was actually before I came here, I heard an interview with Jean Claude, uh, and of course also Chris as well. Jean Claude said that uh, uh, when the interviewer from NPR asked her uh, whether she they were a good problem solving skill, she's probably heard that before, and she said they, uh, eight, they had 18 successes over the years, which doesn't seem like many, and they had 38 failures. So that was kind of an interesting um, thought. I'll just pause there because it goes on for a while. And we received uh, dozens of these in, in the first couple of days, people posting. In fact, uh, you may recognize this particular voice. Uh, Hi, this is Brennan. We're no longer in the park. Uh, we're, we're about to hit Columbus Avenue. Uh, uh, this is my last post, and then I'll quit talking to the post line. Um, 
I, I, as we walked out of the park, I remarked that somehow many more things seemed orange and that I hadn't noticed how many things are orange now. And my girlfriend's response was, uh oh, you call him victim. Two parts. Have a good time, everyone. And that, of course, was Brendan Grilly from uh, Radio Open Source. Uh, he was one of my partners in crime in, in developing this site. And so we just wanted to see an experiment of what would happen if you just opened up a blogging tool as if it were a wiki and, and allowing people to contribute their own multimedia content. And uh, it was a fun little experiment. It really didn't go anywhere, but it, it was fun while it lasted. But then suddenly Hurricane Katrina came along, and I realized that I had a template that could do the exact same thing but could be used in an, an emergency scenario. So I set up this blog called Katrina Aftermath, uh, which had the same rules applied. Anyone could post uh, uh, their own audio files just by calling a phone number. You could post uh, photos. Instead of uh, uploading them as an attachment, we decided to uh, decentralize things and use specific Flickr tags. So you would simply tag it Hurricane Katrina, and it would automatically post the photos as they came in in near real time. Of course, that opens up a certain amount of risks. And if you go down here, I wouldn't be surprised if we find some photos that really have nothing to do with Katrina. There's, there's a great one right there. It could have been actually much more obnoxious than that. Uh, because people, when they use tags on sites like Flickr or YouTube, they can tag anything they want, and it doesn't necessarily have to obey the ideas you had in mind. But we were fortunate that while the hurricane was playing itself out, that uh, Amateur photojournalists who were who were covering the gu the Gulf, uh, as well as just people who were affected by it and had internet access, were able to upload to Flickr, tag it, and that's all they'd have to do, and we would automatically capture the content. Meanwhile, people would use the the email interface on the blog to post uh, their own uh, notes, posting medical requests, missing person requests. It got to the point we actually set up a missing person Flickr tag, so if people were trying to find relatives, they could tag them in certain ways and upload pictures of, of their family members, and we would automatically be able to capture those. Uh, and uh, other sites started doing the same thing, and that eventually involved, evolved into a much bigger project called the Katrina People Finder Project, uh, which basically tried to make sure that all of these collections of, uh, of, of data about missing people could, could interact with each other and understand each other. And uh, again, this is, this is a tool that was set up for public use using zero budget. No money was involved. It took me 30 minutes of work using pre-existing open source or freely available tools. And it's a model that hundreds of other bloggers have used in many other circumstances. And these are just two that I've personally been involved in. Uh, and it's, it's just an, they're just examples of what happens when people are given the tools, uh, sometimes open source, sometimes not, but given the tools in which they can create their, con their own content on an issue they care about and give it away for the, to the public and allow them to add on to it and build on to it as well. It's, it's allowing people to live derivative lives, essentially. Meanwhile, things have advanced. Uh, just in the last year or so, we've started to see some fairly uh, sophisticated examples of independent documentary makers experimenting with these same tools to uh, increase public involvement in documentary making and documentary uh, production. Uh, one example I'd like to show you is, is a, a project that's being done right now by a group of, of open source uh, uh, aficionado is called the Digital Tipping Point. And what this is, is they wanted to put together a documentary about the history of the open source movement uh, from Richard Stallman and the gold, good old days of the late 1970s and all the crazy things he was doing up until now. And immediately, various open source people started uploading their own footage, tagging it in certain ways so they could aggregate it. And next thing they knew, they had about 350 hours of footage, more than anyone working on a small, independent, low-budget project could deal with. And so they formed a partnership uh, with the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive uh, is an amazing site. If you ever have a chance to visit it, I strongly suggest it. They're essentially trying to capture everything that's ever been put on the Internet and, and, and save it for, uh, for historical posterity. And uh, they form various projects focused on different things. One thing they did was soon after September 11th, they, they worked with the Smithsonian to collect all the digital archives that were created in the immediate aftermath of September 11th, in including some work that I did on, on an email discussion list where people were able to send out emergency messages in the hours after the attacks. But in the case of Digital Tipping Point, what they're doing is all of these 358 hours of footage are being posted in modularized clips using a Creative Commons license. And so when you go to the site, uh, first of all, you can dig in and you can take a look at all the various clips. And so they've got 
it's it's kind of like YouTube or, or Blip TV and these other sites in which you can you can watch a video clip. Uh, there's a description. You can add tags. You can rate it and add your own reviews and have discussions of it. Uh, and so that's allowing the community of users working on this documentary to go through this enormous amount of content that's overwhelming all of them. Even if they were a, a team of 10 or 15 people, it would be very hard to do. But with hundreds and hundreds of people from around the world viewing these clips, they're able to start parsing it down and, and assigning metadata to it, tags to figure out how it's all going to fit together. Meanwhile, all of this, again, is released on a Creative Commons license, a, an attribute share-alike license. Because they're open source geeks, they want to really make sure that people can see the content as open source itself and allow people to make their own mashups and videos. They're even encouraging people who completely disagree with the open source movement to take the same footage and put their own spin on it. And so I, I think it's going to be just a matter of time before you see people from all sides of the open source, source debate, both for and against it, mixing their own content together and telling different stories in their own personal and political perspectives on the open source movement. But again, this site, it's still very early on in the process, and so they're still going through these hours and hours of video that they have. The last project I wanted to show off is one that I'm personally very excited about and somewhat scared of, to be quite honest, because it's, it's just so bleeding edge. Uh, it's a project called the Echo Chamber Project. And it's uh, an independent documentary being developed by a guy named uh, Kent Bai. And he uh, he's sort of an, uh, uh, an an amateur a media pundit and observed that in the days weeks and months leading up to the start of the Gulf War he felt that the uh, the main broadcast networks were, had created an echo chamber in which they were treating the war as a foregone conclusion they weren't talking critically about it there wasn't any kind of opposition and so he spent the last year or so going around interviewing dozens and dozens of journalists who were reporters during that time as well as other media experts academics bloggers and others to try to get a sense of what really happened and what was going on and again he's he's in this a similar situation as the digital tipping point folks because he's just one guy with a few few friends volunteering, collecting dozens and dozens of hours of footage of really interesting people. Uh, but the question is, is, since he's got a day job and doesn't have much money for this project, how is it going to be possible for him to make a quality documentary? So he decided to make an online editing tool. And by online editing, I don't mean like uh, online editors and offline editors, Avid and all that. He means a website that functions as an editing interface that would allow users to click and drag and drop uh, little video clips into a particular order and, and generate uh, a, a, a series of clips into their own uh, documentary. And so uh, I'm, our, the timing of this conference is very good because as of last Sunday, I would not have been able to show you this, but he's now got a, a, a version of this live. And it's always disastrous to ever plan on doing a live demo. In fact, when he demos this project at conferences, he always has canned videos and shows them instead. But I'm a risk taker, so I thought we'd go to the site live and see what happened. Because, you know, if it doesn't work, I can still talk, talk my way through it a bit. And so this is the website that's, it's, this isn't even really officially public yet, but it's called echochambermovie.com. And the idea is it's going to be a sort of like a wiki movie tool in the sense that people can upload video clips and then edit them together in a way that makes sense to them. So, for example, in this particular thread, we have Kent's interview that he did with correspondent Bill Plant. And this was an interview that probably lasted about an hour or so, and he and his team of volunteers have already transcribed the whole thing and modular, modularized it into clips of anywhere from 10 seconds to a minute each based on the, just the, the, the back and forth Q&A that they were doing. And using the open source uh, tool known as Drupal, he, uh, Kent has created this tool that now allows you to go and you can come in and listen to any of these clips. So, for example, uh, let's see if this will work. Is, is the volume still on for this? So as, as you can see here, we've got Bill Plant talking, and here's the transcription of it. Uh, while you're listening to it, you're able to rate it and disagree, whether, uh, disagree with it. This is a little unclear whether, you mean it, whether it means you're disagreeing with what the person is saying or disagree whether or not it should be used. Kent is still trying to work on the language for that. But meanwhile, you have the ability to add a tag. So, for example, uh, I can click add a tag. Oops, doesn't want me to do it. 
I won't actually do it then, but normally it does. On my computer, it works just fine. And you, you could type in Bill Plant or CBS News or whatever tag you think is appropriate. And you work your way through all of these clips. And meanwhile, all of the dozens and dozens of other volunteers who are going to be involved in the project will be doing the same thing, adding metadata to, these, to the dozens of hours of, of footage that he has. And so it'll be, it'll be easier for them to start figuring out how it's all going to fit together. But as you're going through this, you can see there are these little click boxes on the left side here. And so I could go through here and find, let's say, out of, out of the 100 or so clips that are on all of these pages, there may be 10 of them that I think stand out. So I would, I would click the buttons on the one I like, and then I would say, add to Andy Carvin's first playlist. And that would then lead, lead, lead me to my playlist. And this is where things get kind of interesting. It will automatically take the clips that I've selected initially just in their original order and create a QuickTime audio stream. Eventually it'll be a QuickTime video stream, but for now, for bandwidth uh, reasons, it's just the audio. And so, so what it'll do is it'll go one after another and it will play each of those clips. But as I'm going through them, let's say I realize that the order doesn't make sense, and, I, and let's say I want to incorporate Kent as the first person in this series of clips. I would drag it up here, and it automatically refreshes everything. So uh, refresh audio with edits. And so the next time we play it, Kent should be at the top. And so it's, in some ways, it's a very crude, at this point, very crude audio version of iMovie or Final Cut Pro. It still doesn't have the kind of timelining uh, setup that you would expect for video editing tools. In some ways, it's, it's almost more exciting for, for, for radio use at this point. But the end goal, and by end goal, I mean like in the next four to five weeks, hopefully, it's going to have uh, uh, the video embedded in it as well. Uh, but they are concerned about bandwidth and just how much that's going to take. So for now, they're just experimenting with the audio. And... Uh, so theoretically, what's going to happen here is that all the volunteers involved in this documentary, they're going to have certain sections of the, of the documentary that they will assign themselves through group discussion and dialogue. And they will, they will tag and collect all the content that's available on the website and pull it together in a meaningful way. Uh, what, so if, if this were the order I felt were appropriate with now having Kent at the top, and then you can hear Kent in the background rather than Bill Plant. Whenever I felt like I was satisfied, they would be able to use their bulletin boards and wiki and others, other tools to discuss how it's all going to be. And once they finally feel like they've got something that's really worth looking at on a TV, this site is going to export an edit decision list that can then be put into Final Cut Pro and eventually Avid and other tools that, assuming they have the footage uploaded and the time codes are all good, it will track that all together and, 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 and start putting together the documentary. One thing I forgot to show is, is the, the edit tool here. So here's Bill Plant, again, this particular clip. Uh, you know, it's whatever, 20 seconds long. Let's say for whatever reason within that 20 seconds I found only seven or eight seconds germane to the section of the documentary I'm working on, I'm able to click the start time and the end time as it's playing and create new in and out points just in the same way you would um, in, a, in, a, in a video editing tool. And then when you go back to your playlist, that will be reflected in what's appearing in the, mo in the, the freshest version of the video. Now, granted, what, what Kent, is, Kent is doing here, this is just for the footage that he and a couple of, of partners shot. It's, it's, it's their camera work, them going around to events over the last year and a half shooting all this footage. But this is an open source tool, and there's really going to be nothing stopping him, I hope, and others making this available online as a video Wikipedia in the sense that would allow any of us, either professionally or as amateurs, to, as, and, or as individuals or as communities of interest working together, uploading clips and, and putting together uh, video documentaries that, that can either appear online or be uh, exported into a proper editing tool with, with uh, uh, hopefully something of broad, relative broadcast quality coming out of it, at least as far as the, the editing uh, uh, decisions go. And so it's, it's taking the principles that exist in a, in a wiki environment but applying it to a video space. And so I kept thinking yesterday uh, during the BBC archive presentation what would happen if they 
connected their archive with a tool like this so people wouldn't have to worry about teaching themselves iMovie or, or Adobe Premiere, whatever it is, and be able to use that interface. And then what would happen after that when these tools get uh, interlinked with something with sites like Blip TV, OurMedia.org, uh, YouTube, and others, where larger groups of content are being, uh, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of clips, sometimes millions of clips are being uploaded by the public, and tagged using people's individual folksonomies. Uh, suddenly you have a situation where you have a video editing tool where the entire internet archive of video, and, and I mean the entire internet, of where, of, through these major sites, theoretically you could be pulling from and, and putting stuff together. Uh, perhaps not truly in a professional way initially, but it, this is just one guy in his free time creating this tool, and it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, one of the one of the issues that uh, is it on? Yeah. It's indeed on. Um, Andy, one of the issues that, that that your presentation raises is issue of segmentation. So at the Internet Archive, we have um, in in my specific collection almost. 2,000 films, they average about 12 to 15 minutes each. And it's very hard to touch a piece of video that's that long. You know, um, how, do you, how do you get into it? How do you address it? And um, in this case, what's happening is you're relying on the, or he's relying on the users to segment. But I think that segmentation is something to think about from the beginning if we're planning open content repositories. What makes sense? Do we leave it to the user? Do we segment uh, conceptually? Do we, seg do we leave it up to a machine, um, which is something that usually doesn't work, although it might work in specialized cases? But I think it's a central issue to consider from the beginning when you kind of conceptualize what you're doing. Yeah, and I think the answer is probably all of the above because it's going to depend on, on what the footage is and how you intend people to use it because, uh, you know, a lot of this is all in the eye of the beholder as well because what you may think is a, is a distinct clip, others may believe that there are distinct segments within that and they should be segmented. And so tools like this would allow people to, to parse it even further. But I think, it, I think you're right that at the same time when... when uh, public broadcasting, public media are uploading their content, that they have to be very thoughtful about this, whether they're, they're manually, manually separating clips uh, or they're uh, tagging it in such a way that the machines understand where the, the endpoints are. And so that could get very technical, but it's, it's doable. Hi, I'm um, Darlene Wilson from WGBH, and I was a producer on the uh, Lab Sandbox project, which will be featured at tomorrow morning's panel. Um, and I have been thinking quite a bit about open content since we started this project about two months ago. Um, I've been thinking about it before that, but really think about it since then. And uh, some of the things that Annie pointed out, I, I totally agree that what we produce um, within public broadcasting, especially GPH, is really fabulous stuff. Um, and the idea of let's not forget what people come to us for that's valuable to people that do come to us for what they come to us for. But there are a lot of people who don't come to us, is one piece. And um, in terms of clip art or clip video art, I think that as a baby step along the way, clip art had a place in desktop publishing that opened up the next step and the next step after that. And what I would like to suggest to um, producers, especially, I think one of the sort of subtexts behind the question of why would we put our stuff out there for other people to do what we do best, I would suggest that um, the people are fundamentally curious and fundamentally creative. And our culture at large squashes creativity and curiosity to a large degree. I think public broadcasting as, as a mission has been to counteract that. And the, um, Add, be curious, repudious, very good ad. I think we're at a point where 
if we don't enable people to develop their own creativity, they're not going to be able to develop curiosity beyond that. And I would suggest that if, um, you know, if you're a documentary filmmaker, for instance, did the process of creating that film make you less curious or more curious about the medium? Did it make you want to know who else had done things? Did it make you want to become more familiar with the masters? So I, I see open content for public broadcasting as an opportunity for us to extend what we do, just as websites extended the broadcast message into another medium. Open content can take what websites do, which is not to say it's either or. It's not like everything has to be open and you know, we can't do what we've done before. But I think it's, it's an extension and it's a partner of that that if we can <clears throat> um, invite our audience to play as well, we're actually inviting them to get to know us on, on a deeper level, on a more intimate level. And um, that's what I wanted to say. That's, that's great, Darlene. I'd, I'd love to do a quick comment back, uh, or in addition, is, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> It's also a question of economics, though, isn't it? Because, you know, when I think about, you know, one of the um, examples we are going to, can I, can I plug this in? Uh, Dave, you mentioned at what point in green lighting do we require more? Well, think about before when we required a treatment of the program, and then we required the fact that there was going to be a website. Well, pretty soon, it couldn't just be a website. It had to be what was in the website. Well. On those websites, you know, in the beginning we had visions of, oh, the cutting room floor. But, you know, sometimes it's on the floor for a reason. And so it's, if we could just be practical about it and say, well, in addition to the program and the web, you know, if you could give us 12 minutes of open content, I think we're better off creating some type of criteria. Nobody wants to crush somebody's creativity. But to just give hours and hours and hours, I mean, if, I love this idea of echo chamber because you can help co-tag it. So when I make the uh, correlation back to clip art, I mean, how many times have you just spent hours and hours not being able to use any of it? So it's really a matter of economics and balance and bringing to the table what we, what I think people appreciate. So I, I don't want to give that up and just put anything out there because we can. It's about storytelling and such. Yeah, I just, um, I wonder though about losing the context of the original work. And I, and I really mean it when, you know, I understood what Ken Burns was saying in that conversation with Cringely about wanting people the first time through to hear the story as he put it together. And then afterwards, you know, dissect it, travel with it, do whatever with it you want, but hear the. F Hear the full story to start with. And that's why I think the CC Mixter project is interesting because as you've got people creating samples and loops and they start spreading out throughout the universe that there's a virtual paper trail that here's my mix of things of, of a bunch of clips that I use from the Beastie Boys and uh, I actually did that when, this, when the, um, the Wired Creative Commons CD came out I, I, I spent the better part of a weekend trying to see if I could remix Beastie Boy, Boys songs successfully and um, you know I enjoy them but I don't think I'd ever want to force them onto the public. But meanwhile, there were lots of other people who did great work with it. And, and, and I, it's, I think it is important for them to be able to share that work and, and celebrate that work. But at the same time, the beasties deserve credit. And, there's, and by being able to tag it through the system and be able to see where it comes from, that's, it's, it's useful for them. And it, it gives them a sense of how it's being used. The, uh, not to go too much on a tangent here, but the uh, musician Beck, uh, recently announced in Wired Magazine that his next album, if you still want to call it that, isn't going to be really an album anymore. It's going to be his interpretation of a bunch of loops and tracks of things that he's put together, which of course is what any CD normally is, but he's calling it that because he's going to be releasing the original source materials of everything as well, and he's going to encourage the public to remix everything, to see what happens and, and share it and tag it, because his last album, he noticed that people were remixing it anyway and getting in trouble with his record company, so he figured, well, why don't we just acknowledge this, let people do it and track it and get people to do album cover art contests and, and, video, and make videos of the songs and, and that will be the album so it's no longer an album anymore it's, 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 it's an online installation of art that, that just happens to be a bunch of loops being interpreted by a bunch of people So at that point Beck really had no expectation that people would listen to his story 
as he put it together, because he hasn't really put it together. He's well, he's still thrown out a bunch he's of still videos. convinced he's going to sell sell more CDs this way because people are going to want to hear his interpretation of it. He's, he's releasing an interpretation. He is. He is. Okay. He is, and that will be central to. Him. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'd like to get uh, at least one of you could comment on this because it could be difficult. So much of what's being said here. Uh, um, so, uh, so much of what you, you've said so far uh, strikes me as, as, you know, first of all, profound, and, and it's going to happen. The, the force behind these changes is too great to resist. Um, and when I hear these discussions, I, I reflect on them in terms of how does this actually affect a station? You know, because those are sort of the building blocks of our system. So, I was, you guys have all thought about this. What applications, as, you, as you've gone through these today, have relevance to a station's long-term existence? I wouldn't mind taking a stab at that. Uh, great question. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about, and I don't know if this holds up across all models, but if we once and for all set our priorities straight within our system, I mean, our system's so great because it's membership, and we think about the value proposition of what it means to respect our audiences when we think about our audiences in this way, in this order. So if our first priority is the user and the viewer, and our second priority is the station, and our third is the producer, the fourth the system, fifth the funder, some situations that I've been kind of mapping this onto, I think sometimes the station and producer could swap. But if we are always putting the user at the center, I think the business model will follow, and if we don't have the station as a close second, we lose all that localness of it. And I don't know if Deborah May Hughes is here from Public Interactive. Deborah, uh, her group in Public Interactive has just done amazing work in terms of building an online, uh, I'm going to butcher it, I'm sorry, but a local national system that when you log on to somebody's website, it could be in a central place, Dave, but you feel like you're in San Francisco at KQED. And I feel like if we can get our priorities straight, because every time we say, well, the user should come first, and they say, yeah, but you know, when we did our, our uh, TV broadcast, you know, you put the zip code, there's always a yeah, but. There's always a we wish we could, but. But if we can hold true to that order, I think, I think we have our priorities straight. So if we built a central system for stations that don't have any ability or resources to have that be their front page, and can anyway. So in some ways, a syndication, with central system, we could have it be counted in accurate ways. We can look at uh, statistical metrics. So you can report those to your local sponsors, you know, the kind of work Google's doing with ad insertion. Imagine if they've got an ad insertion that can take two files on the fly, and so if you look at it from KQED, you see the national sponsor and they've put in their local sponsor. I think we've got we've to solve this in this order and not always think about it from the other way around. Is that? Well, yeah, I, thought, I was wondering if maybe your question should be directed also to the station people here. Would that be helpful? Well, um, it's Follow the rule number one of ask the user, go, you know, listen to the viewer. We'd have content would be the second thing on the list. <clears throat> and that, you know, from my house in, in the Mid-Hudson Valley, I don't really think often that I'm looking for a station. I'm looking for content. And it just happens to be delivered right now by a station. And I, I work with mostly stations, so this is a troubling issue. Sorry, but I, 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 think, I, think, I, think our, I think our solutions tend to take the form of station solutions because that's who we are. But they're not, they're not, that's not the natural fit from the user point of view. Uh, could I just add to that? I think we also need to remember that stations provide community context and that you know, a, a station in the Hudson Valley is going to know what's going on in the Hudson Valley better than, than what I'm doing in Washington, D.C. or some crazy blogger is doing in Hong Kong. Or, you know, I, I'm, so I'm kind of... Personally, I'm, I'm agnostic about what tools we use and how they're hosted and all that. I'm more concerned about whether or not they capture the zeitgeist of the community and it's seen as a place within the community that people have a sense of ownership of. This, this, is, a, a, this is a site and a tool for us, about us, by us, with us. And uh, 
so some of the sites I set up, like the gates at Central Park, there's nothing stopping uh, a station or any other entity within a community setting up a similar project for a local county fair or a recent disaster or earthquake that happened. It, the, these these tools uh, these tools can be set up very easily. It's a matter of serving whatever the local community interest is. In, but in case it's not obvious, the point of view that I'm, I'm putting forward here is from a strategic system point of view, when we make decisions internally, if we can prioritize it from that point of view, and it's for exactly Andy's reason. So for, for in my thought, it was thinking about that from, a, from that point of view. So the content is implied in the user. I'd like to just hold for a moment. I know your question for Jackie is answering as a station person, so if we pass the mic. Um, so Jackie, I was wondering as a as a station person, KCET, I wear two hats. I wear the KCET.org hat, and I also wear the national producer hat. And I'm, I'm not worrying about that distinction right now, local, national, because I'm mar writing in my margins projects that I think are appropriate to local. I'm writing in the margins uh, activities that I think, you know, a creative commons area in our wired science project. You know, it's, it depends upon the project. It's just being smart in the way I've been thinking about the tools. And right now, I don't... I don't really care because I see all sorts of possibilities depending upon the platform, my audience, the user that we're trying to reach. So I just think it's it's fruitful thinking. So I'm not making a distinction one way or the other, local, national. It just depends upon what the content is. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much a question as a as a comment. One of the things that I think is worth thinking about is that by design, every piece of content we put on the internet, or anyone puts on the internet, unless you prevent it deliberately, and that never works, is open content. The users are gonna do with it what they want, where they want, and the only thing we have to stop them are lawyers. And we can <laughs> play whack-a-mole for everybody that takes our stuff and reconstitutes and reuses it, or we can recognize the audience's ability and interest in doing that with whatever con content they find. And we can do things that facilitate an engagement process with an audience to make a new special thing, which is why echo chamber is interesting as a concept. The fact that it's open is less important to the, as I say, crux of the biscuit for that project than it is the structure built around it to have the community create a new thing from the assets that are there. But if we think that people can't print out every page they want from our website and photocopy it and give it to their kids in the class or rip our allegedly DRM protected materials off our various download own services, we're kidding ourselves. And so if we don't recognize the technological reality and deliver value to offset the negative impact of those technical realities, we're, we're not doing well by ourselves. It, I, unfortunately, I wasn't here this morning, but uh, we don't know most of the people who are ripping it off, and whether they have our permission or not only matters when it becomes visible enough that it either compromises a rights agreement we have with somebody else, or we think it's impacting our revenue stream. The, there are sites that we've produced where particular images have become a cultural meme all over MySpace, and they're embedded in people's MySpace pages. And they're being hosted still by us at PBS, but for the purposes of the user, the, the, the image is part of their new derivative work. We, there's no way to stop this. So embrace it, work with it, deliver value to the user, and don't feel like this is going to sneak up on us and change the world, because it, it did that about 10 years ago. Lou's got one. Uh, she just handed it to me. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk or not. Uh, but since I have a mic, I might as well talk. Uh, the, the one thing that, that strikes me about actually what you were just saying and what uh, the echo chamber, uh, and the thing that I, I and this is me being news houring, so take that for what it will, um, is the thing that worries me is, uh, yes, people can do it. 
you know, we may even want to allow people to do it, but to embrace it fully, to host it in some way as part of our content is something that deeply troubles me. Because if I allowed the, the visitors to the online news hour, and this is based solely on my interactions with them via email, uh, to create content using what we generate, we would have a very liberal, angry, anti-Bush product. And that is not the product that represents the entire United States. That's the product that represents the portion of the United States that watches the news hour and chooses to engage the technology that allows them to do this. So something that just sticks in my head as I think about what our job is as journalists presenting different sides of a story is how do we make sure that we reach out to the people who don't want to mash video, who don't want to do this, who don't have the technical abilities or skills or time. I mean, think about the, the videos they were showing today. They're all liberal. Now, I'm sure there are conservatives out there. I mean, they voted. Uh, and so, so how do we make sure that we don't become a parody of ourselves by focusing, and, and, and by focusing on the user, because I'm all about the user, um, how do we not become just talking to ourselves, literally becoming our own echo chamber of the opinions held by the people who happen to have the technology, the time, and the interest? Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Lee, great, great question. Um, those people make use of other tools in other ways. Um, visit the, uh, the discussion board for uh, now politics and the economy. And you'll see that those people do have a voice in this space, and they abuse it regularly there. Um, no, I, I agree with you. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a great question. We're, we're seeing very politically biased uh, use of the of the technology and yeah, I th I think when you go to conferences, there are a set of usual suspects of mashups that get shown, and the ones they've been showing lately tend to be Bush parodies because that's the thing people are doing right now. But at the same time, like Michelle, the blogger Michelle Malkin, who's a very conservative uh, blogger, very influential on the internet. I was just on a panel with her last week, and she was talking about uh, a new video blogging service she's launched, and actually a for-profit company that's in, that they wa she wants to be like the YouTube of conservative bloggers. And so, uh, and she showed some clips and these were very well done, well edited, funny, politically biting clips done by 18, 20 year old conservatives uh, about their their perspective of the world and how they're perceiving other people are, are, are going through life in, in 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 today's circumstances and it's and it's and it's 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 too bad that we didn't have some of those clips because they are quite a contrast to the the, the, the anti Bush ones and so I I I think the liberals got into mashups a little sooner than the conservatives but you know give it another six months and it'll even out and it'll just be another reflection of society and at the end of the day aren't we really just talking about people changing the meaning of its original, original intent. I mean, whether it's politics or whether it's gender, that, that once you, we don't like that it might be too liberal or it might be too fill in the blank, but we're worried about people changing our meaning. I personally would love to see, maybe not for the world to see, parodies of how people make fun of us. I think that would be really yeah. interesting, and I think we should be bold enough to hear it. Well, like the wasn't it Chevy, I think it was, did this on online competition in which they encouraged people to upload videos of why they love Chevy and why I, there was a, I forget what exactly what the mission statement was, but it was intended to be a collection of people bragging about their Chevys. But in the end, it turned out to be a large collection of videos complaining about their Chevys and what they'd like to see the company do different. And what did the company do? They Please. posted all of them. They put it all online and, and talked about it and said, this is the way we're learning from the public because if people are taking the time to tear our product apart, then we know we need to change the way we're doing business and fix some of these things. And, and like Advertising Age said it was the most brilliant thing they'd seen all year. Okay. Just a quick, just a quick, not on? On. It's on, I think. Not on. It's on. I'll be there. Uh, just I found uh, echo chamber a fascinating example, and I just had a, a quick question because I don't think I quite understood it. Mm -hmm. And that is, is the first of all, you know, hats off to somebody who actually goes out and shoots new material 
you know, not just sitting <laughs> back and aggregating other people and trading existing materials. Yep. So I have to applaud that. That, yeah. that is well. Terrific. The video blogging is growing every day. There are well, tens I mean, of thousands of us doing know, what, this. You have stuff. to have the. You have to yeah. shoot it. You mm -hmm. have to actually do the interviews. Well, that's what I mean. So there, there are tens so of thousands. So I think doing that's great. Kind of no, I'm yeah. just saying that's great because that that really is uh, a step forward. But what I'm curious about is, I guess I've misunderstood two parts. Will there be the vision of this person who, who started it, mm -hmm. or is this a collection of of 11 people who will be made, you know, no one's name will be Good on question. this. It will be a, a collection of 11 people. And secondly, the material is, is open, so that means that it's, it's not only going to be a film, but it's also going to be available for other people to make their own films, right, mm -hmm. as I understand the problem. Yep. And so did the people being interviewed understand this new idea. Did well, they sign up for it. Uh, let me start with the first part. Uh, when I've heard Kent talk about it, he describes it as he feels that he could come up with a very singular auteur vision of what the documentary should be, but he feels like it would be a much better product if there were a community of people working with him to come up with a consensus of how the story should be framed. And so uh, Ken is still Kent is still the executive producer and and. You know, he could he calls the shots the way he wants, but he feels that the public should have input, and and it's probably not going to be. I don't expect to see thousands of people working on this project with him. There are probably going to be several hundred people signed up and several dozen people really passionate about it, because that's just the way these online collaborations often work. And so he would then be serving as the facilitator and moderator of this group, and it's it's really going to be up to him to decide how much of his own personal imprint he puts on it and how much he 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 just lets. Go and lets them do it. So only time will really tell. Uh, the second part of your question it was when when they, he did the interviews. Right, right, right. Yes, he did. Do the interview. I, as far as I know, he did with everyone because he interviewed me almost a year ago now, last October at the We Media conference, and and he told me up front, everything you say will be put online, available in Creative Commons, and people will be doing stuff with it. It's primarily for the documentary, but we I want to see competing visions and com competing ideas, and so uh, and. I wish I had a copy of the release because uh, I did have to sign a release for the interview, and uh, I think he did document that. So it would be interesting to see how he phrased it. I just wish I could remember it. Right. Judith, read Tim for the last one. Judging from my earlier experience of getting back Five more minutes, they're saying. The people have spoken. <laughs> yes, do you dig this or not? So, user input says five more minutes. Uh, Tim? Uh, no pressure. I guess my question has to be really good. All right, so, I'll just make it a comment. And I just sort of worry that we're going to fall into a fi false dichotomy where we're going to ask Lee and Lou to go to that side of the room and everybody else to go to this side of the room and we'll sort of battle it out over open content as being everything gets mashed up and everything gets thrown in versus not. And we'll, we'll hear from the Creative Commons folks and others throughout, the, throughout the, the, the next days, whereas there's a whole variety of licensing types and, you know, we, we, and windowing strategies that it's, it's much more about the subtleties than, oh, let's take all front lines and throw it in. I mean, even Creative Commons has no derivatives as a potential where you can see this, but you can't mash it up. Mash it up. That's a, one of the many licensing types. And it's so important that we remember that for all kinds of reasons, not least of which is economics. That continuum of what we can do and what we think we should do within our role as public media, public broadcasters. That's, that's great, too. That was worth the wait. Mm -hmm. um, I was really glad that Annie put up that, that last slide um, because I think as with the definitions of open content, we're not going to necessarily, in this really evolving environment, be able to find one value chain that's going to work. So that as a person who's somewhere in transition between being a producer, a system person, a station person, and who is a user, so the only thing I'm not is a funder right now, uh, I think we, we, want, we want the comfort of having this kind of a, a diagram but as Annie even said as she was putting it up, well, sometimes these two will switch. And I think that's really going to be the case. So I'd, I'd imagine it, I'd, 
propose that maybe we think about it as certainly, I think everyone agrees the focus is on the user, the focus is on the audience, on the American public, but rather than a particular chain that this comes first and this comes second to ensure that nobody's left out, we might want to think of it as the viewer, user, and then a cluster that includes, and I know that's less comfortable than, than this, that includes the funder, the system, the producer, and the station working in partnership to serve the user and trying to figure out in collaboration as each of these new technologies come along and each of these new delivery platforms come along, what are the best roles for each in that particular instance? And because I think we're in that kind of fluid environment where it's going to change and it's going to keep changing our commitment is to serving the user and the viewer and to finding the best role for each participant, whether it's the station or the system, and, and, and just knowing that, that that's going to be changing a lot and going back and forth for quite a period of time going forward. I just think we're not going to have this comfortable a hierarchy. We, we originally, I sh I'll, I'll take responsibility in this one, I originally had it as the value to the user is, so when you start a new project, regardless of what the project is, the value to the station is, and I didn't have it in a hierarchy as much as I had, if we could create, because I say the same thing about with, with funders. I mean, how many times have we gone to funders saying, fund this, it'll be good for you? You know, we have to start thinking about them as our audience, too. Don't go into editorial firewalls. I'm not saying about that. I'm saying that if we go to a funder and say, you know, we understand what you do. And here's how we can work together. Don't go to a technology company and tell them how we can advance what they do yesterday. Go to a technology company and say, I have a feeling you might be going this direction. Let's go there together. So I had it. The value to the fill-in-the-blank is. But I thought this hierarchy would stimulate a little more conversation. <laughs> Good job, guys. Likewise. Good panel. Good comments, too.